Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this ninth session on reinforcement learning at this year's ICML. My name is Shimon Weitz, and I'll be your session chair. Let's get started right away with the first speaker. Rachid Duby will tell us about investigating human priors for playing video games. Thanks a lot. My name is Rachid, and this work is in collaboration with Pulkit, Deepak, my advisor Tom, and Alyosha at UC Berkeley. So when we humans come across a new visual environment, we don't just see the pixels, but rather we use our vast amount of prior information to actually interpret and understand those pixels. Let me start off by doing a small thought experiment with all of you. Let's say I sit all of you in front of a computer screen and ask you to play this game in front of you. Now, most people in the room have probably never seen this game before. Now, even before you press a single key, and even though you've not played this game before, you can already make a lot of inferences about this game. For example, you can already say who you are in this game. You can already tell what your goal in this game is. You can also say what the bad guys in this game are. And you can also infer how to reach towards the goal. So now, if I was to give you this game to play, most of you will be able to solve this game very, very quickly. All right, great. Now, I will give you another game to play, which looks something like this. Now, can you make the previous inferences that you made uh, in this game? Probably not. So now this game may seem very confusing to most people in the room. However, this game is actually the same as the previous game that I showed to you, but we have just simply re-rendered this with new textures. Even though, fundamentally, this game is still the same as the previous game, most people in the room would probably have a very hard time trying to solve this game. So let's quantify this thought experiment. We recruited 40 different human subjects to play both these games. And we found that people are able to solve the ga first game very easily, taking just under a minute or equivalently 3,000 action inputs. But humans take a, uh, in contrast, humans take a much longer time to solve the second game, taking close to two minutes or twice the action inputs to solve the game. Now, if I was to give these two games to an RL agent to solve, the RL agent is actually unaffected by the changes in the two games, taking close to four million steps to solve both these games. Now, in hindsight, this should not be surprising. Remember, RL comes without any prior information. It comes tabula rasa. So both these games actually carry roughly the same amount of information from the perspective of the RL agent. So what I was trying to demonstrate through this very, very simple experiment is that prior knowledge plays a very important role in human cognition, and it helps us to solve new and complex tasks with relative ease. So in this work, we are not going to be talking much about the RL algorithm, but instead, what we want to do is actually understand what makes humans so good at solving new and seemingly complex tasks with relative ease. More specifically, we want to investigate what are the different kinds of priors people bring in that allow for efficient gameplay. So in this work, we are going to take a very cognitive science approach, and we are going to conduct a lot of human experiments to quantify the importance of different priors people bring in that enable efficient gameplay. And here we are focusing on video games because video games are a popular testbed for the current reinforcement learning community. We can easily modify them, and we can run large-scale human studies with relative ease. All right, so how do we go about quantifying the importance of various priors people bring in? So to do this, we first created an elaborate game environment, which looks something like this. It consisted of an agent sprite, various platforms, ladders, and enemies. The agent could be moved with the help of arrow keys, and its goal was to reach towards the door at the top after having obtained the key. And now this game was reset whenever the agent touched any of the enemy or it fell below the lowermost platform. So note that this game is a very hard exploration problem because the only reward given to players was when they reached to the top of the door. So to quantify the importance of various priors, what we are going to do is that we are going to systematically start modifying this game to remove various priors that people bring in when they play this game. These priors include priors about semantics, objects as sub-goals, affordances, similarity, gravity, motor control, and so forth. So for each game version that we created to quantify human performance, we recruited 120 different participants to play each game. And people were not given any instructions on how to solve the game, except that they have to use arrow keys to move, and they have to finish the game as quickly as possible. All right, so let's begin by looking at the original game. So what are the kinds of priors that are helping us here? Well, one very obvious prior is that of semantics. So 
for example, when we look at this game, we immediately know that we should use this key to reach towards the door, or we should be avoiding the spike or angry pink-like looking object. So perhaps semantics is one of the most important prior that helps humans to solve this game very quickly. So to study the importance of semantics, we created another game version, which looks something like this. So all we did here was re-rendered uh, all the different objects with blocks of uniform color. So if you were to play this game, now you can't easily infer what the semantics of the objects are. So, and we can now measure the importance of semantics by comparing human performance across both these games. So if we want to measure human performance, the first thing we can look at is the average time taken that people take to solve each game. And this time taken is in minutes. So we see that people are able to solve the original game very easily, taking just under two minutes to solve the game. Next, we can also look at the number of deaths encountered by player when they're solving each game. And we see that when people are solving the original game, the number of deaths they encountered is also very low. We can also look at the exploration pattern of people by looking at the unique XY locations, that is the number of states they visited while they're solving each game. This is again unitless, and we see that when people are solving the original game, the number of states they explored is also very low. In contrast, if we compare the human performance in the game where we mask semantics, we see that masking semantics clearly hurts human performance. As the time they take to solve this game rises from two minutes to over four minutes, they die more and they explore more as well. Okay, great. So we saw that when we mask semantics, human performance goes down quite a bit. However, we are still able to solve this game in a reasonable time. Why was this happening? Well, one of the first things you notice in this game is these visibly distinct objects that immediately draw your attention. So perhaps we have a prior about objects, that objects in this game are interesting and important to explore. How important is this notion of objects? To, do, uh, to test this, we created another game version, which looks something like this. So this game is actually the same as the previous game that I showed you, but all we have done is re-rendered the free space in the platforms with placebos. So when you're playing this game, and if you come across a uniform block, you cannot easily infer whether that is a placebo or whether that's a real object. So in this game, basically what we're doing is you can't actually infer where the objects in this world are. And we see that when we mask object locations, human performance drops down significantly as the time that they take to solve this game rises from two minutes to over eight minutes, they die more and they explore more as well. Our human subjects were definitely not happy when, we pl when they were playing this game, as we received many frustrated and confused emails from our subjects saying that, what is happening? We can't figure it out. This is very, like, I reached to the top and I still don't know what to do with this game. People could still solve this game, but this game was clearly much, much tougher for human subjects. So the main takeaways of our previous two experiments is that we see that while knowledge of semantics is very important for humans to solve games easily, we have a general notion about objects, that objects are sub-goals for efficient exploration, and this is even more critical for efficient gameplay. Okay, now let's return back to the original game. So what we did in the previous two manipulations is that we made the inference of underlying reward structure quite non-trivial. However, in all these previous games, you still had a notion of ladders, um, platforms, as well as free space. So basically, having an inference of these objects helped you figure out possibilities for different actions. For example, you know that ladders afford the action of climbing, platforms afford the action of walking. Gibson termed these as affordances. Let's now test out how important is this notion of affordances. To do that, we created a game version, which looks something like this, where we have re-rendered the free space, the platforms and textures, such that you can't easily infer where the platforms or ladders in this game are. So when you're playing this game, you can't basically figure out what is happening, where the platforms or ladders are. And note that you can see that the semantics of all the different objects are still preserved because we want to study the importance of affordances separately. We see that when we mask affordances, human performance again drops down. People take close to four minutes to solve the game. They die more and they explore more as well. So when we mask semantics, there was uh, one information that was helping you is some, some notion of similarity. For instance, once you had figured out that these dark-like looking things are platforms and these light green textures are ladders, you could use that inference to figure out where the other platforms or ladders in this game are. So perhaps we do have a notion about uh, things that look the same, act the same, and we actually end up ex exploiting visual similarity. 
So to test this, we created a game version which looks something like this, wherein all the platforms and ladders are of different textures. So here, when you're playing this game, even if you've figured out that this dark-like looking thing is a platform, you can't infer where the other platforms or uh, ladders in this game are. So we see that when we mask similarity, human performance drops down significantly again. People take close to eight minutes to solve the game, people die more, and they explore much more as well. So the main takeaways of the previous two experiments that we have done so far is that knowledge of affordances is very important for, human, uh, for efficient human gameplay, but there's a general notion, and that is that of visual similarity, that is even more critical. Okay, so so far, we have tested all different objects uh, one at a time. Now how about we have a bit of fun and see what happens to human performance if you were to remove all object priors. To do that, we created this nasty looking game version, which did not have any semantics, affordances, um, similarity, as well as ob object locations. And if you look at human performance, recall that uh, in the original game, people just take two minutes to solve the game. Uh, masking all object priors makes humans extremely inefficient, as the time that they take to solve this game rises from two minutes to over 20 minutes. People die much more as well, and people explore mu much more areas of this game as well. So, you know, like previous game versions created some frustration and confusion in subjects. This game version wrecked havoc amongst our human subjects. We received many angry emails from our subjects in the middle of the night saying, they are not lab mice, how do you expect them to solve this ridiculous game? And some people actually even abusing us. Rest assured, we you know, compensated all the subjects for their time and effort. Now, if you look at the exploration trajectory of people, we see that exploration trajectory of people in the original game is quite systematic. But when we masked all object priors, we see that the exploration trajectory of participants is very, very random, as people are exploring very random uh, spaces on this, uh, in this game. So let's take a step back to reflect on these results. We humans arguably have great optimization and exploration techniques that we employ. But we see that with poor representation and without any prior information, all of that is actually pointless if we don't know where to base our exploration upon. OK, so so far, Hopefully, what I've convincingly demonstrated is that prior knowledge uh, plays a very important role in enabling efficient human gameplay. Now, let's try to answer the question I'd raised in the beginning of the talk. That is, what are the most important priors that people employ? And if we compare all the four object priors that we've tested out so far, we see that there's a general pattern starting to emerge here. So whenever we come across a game, uh, for example, the specific game that we saw here, there are some very game-specific prior knowledge that we employ. That is that of keys are used to open the door, uh, ladders are meant to be climbed, platforms are meant to be walked. And these game-specific prior information, that is that of semantics and affordances, are clearly very important for humans. However, there are some priors that are independent of the game that we, that we play, and that is that of similarity and that of object locations. So any game that you play, you know that there are some objects in this world and I should explore them. Or any game that you play, you know that there is some form of similarity and I should exploit that. And these general object priors about similarity and object locations are one of the most critical priors that enable efficient human gameplay. So to summarize the main takeaways of our human experiment so far, we see that general object priors, such as objects are sub-goals for efficient exploration, and visual similarity are more critical for efficient ga human gameplay. OK, so so far we have looked into human performance in detail. But now let's also investigate RL performance in, in more detail. To do that, we created a simpler game environment, as the previous game was much harder for current RL algorithms to solve. And then we systematically remove various priors, such as semantics, object locations, affordances, as well as visual similarity. And if we see the performance of an RL agent on these games, we see that the RL agent is actually unaffected by most of these game manipulations, as it takes nearly the same time to solve the original game, the one with mass semantics, object locations, as well as affordances. Only in the case of similarity does the uh, RL take uh, much uh, RL performance actually worsen, as it takes nearly two times to solve that game. Uh, our hypothesis is that is because of the use of convolutional neural networks by uh, RL agents. So for us, the case of object locations is perhaps the most interesting, because as we saw, that is one of the most important prior for human gameplay, but RL is actually unaffected by that manipulation. So current years has, recent years has seen a lot of striking success in re reinforcement learning. But we also know that a current problem of RL algorithms is that they take a long training time to, uh, to solve uh, simple games. 
So now there are two very broad ways in, we can, in which we can look to improve the sample efficiency of RN. The first being that we can look to improve their exploration and optimization techniques that they employ. And a lot of recent work has focused on that and made very impressive uh, improvements in that. An orthogonal direction is that of prior knowledge. Um, that is, perhaps our RL agents ne don't necessarily need to start training from scratch. And um, uh, perhaps our RL agents don't necessarily need to uh, start training from scratch. And as of now, only a limited amount of uh, work has been done in that direction. So what our work advocates is for more research in that direction. So of course, we are not the first ones to say that prior knowledge is important, but our work sort of reinforces, no pun intended, that more work is needed in this direction. So now this is more speculative and high level, but a good news from our investigation so far is that uh, we have some insights on what kind of priors we should look to incorporate in our RL agents. So they don't have to be very game-specific uh, prior knowledge, that is, specific knowledge about keys, doors, ladders, platforms, but more general notion of, that is, there are objects in the world they should explore and exploit visual similarity. They are perhaps more important prior knowledge. So prior knowledge can be incorporated in RL agents either in a hard-coded manner or by some form of continual learning, and both these directions will be interesting future research directions. So here's one more cool thing. So, um, there is some interesting links of our work with research done in developmental psychology as well. So, so far we found that um, general object price such as object as sub goals and similarity are critical for efficient gameplay. And we can also look at how do babies actually learn to acquire these priors. So, various studies in developmental psychology have shown that babies as little as two to five months old start developing some, uh, exhibiting some preliminary notions of objects and visual similarity. Only by the time babies are 18 to 24 months old do they start developing more nuanced um, uh, ideas about semantics and affordances. So perhaps our, uh, one indication of our work is that the priors that we learn very early on in our childhood end up being some of the most critical priors for efficient human gameplay. That being said, so far I've talked about incorporating prior knowledge in RL agents to improve their sample efficiency. But, coming, um, but incorporating uh, prior knowledge in RL agents can actually um, have some challenges as priors can end up constraining our exploration. For example, we just created this very simple game that consisted of a robot sprite and a princess and some hidden rewards indicated in dashed yellow boxes. And here we find that humans are actually outperformed by a random agent because humans don't end up exploring this environment quite a lot. So while incorporating prior knowledge in RL agents is a very useful research direction, future work should also keep in mind that priors can actually under constrain exploration in some settings. So to sum up, um, what our work has shown that prior knowledge is, plays a very crucial role in enabling efficient exploration in humans. And general priors that are uh, very en environment independent, like objects as sub goals for exploration, similarity are critical for efficient gameplay. And our works calls for um, incorporating prior knowledge in RL either directly or via um, continual learning if you want to build RL agents with human-like efficiency. So all our games are actually available to play on our website. I encourage you to go back and look at some of the games. All our codes are available on GitHub as well. And please do drop by a poster if you have more questions. Thanks. We have a couple minutes for questions. If you have a question, please um, find a mic. Hi. Uh, really interesting talk. Uh, something with respect to the experiments, what I notice is that basically across experiments, uh, the relationship between uh, how the states of the, the visual states are related to the actual mark of decision, state, mark of decision process defining the RL problem are changing, right? The more you complicate the game, the more uh, broader is the equivalence class between uh, perceptions and, uh, and uh, the actual states of the RL game. So I'm wondering, is there any way that you can control for this? Or, uh, like, don't you think that if you have humans that, say, play for a week in this altered version, they learn slowly these new equivalence classes between uh, semantics and pixel transformation, then I think they will be just playing the game really quickly, like, in the, in the next step. Right. You try something. Right. Um, thanks for the question. So the first thing is all these games are actually fundamentally still the same. We have just re-rendered the visual textures. So uh, the shortest part to solve each game remains no, the same. Sorry on this. So you re by re-rendering the, the textures and by having a mapping between uh, RL states to 
only one or multiple. Like you, you do not have a, a bijective mapping anymore between perceptual and the real states. This is what I was pointing out. Right. Uh, that's a fair point. And regarding your question about uh, if humans were to play this game for a long period of time, yes, they will actually hopefully end up learning the new um, instances of this game. But the whole idea is that there is some form of continual learning that's happening. And that's exactly what we're trying to advocate here. Um, so um, I have a um, quick question. So this might not be a valid concern, but, um, but as, you, as you obfuscate the game more and more, um, um, it's, it's, I, I understand that you're also removing more and more priors from the game, but do you think that the human's performance might be degrading because the game becomes less and less interesting or because people just get bored of the game? I mean, how do you account for that? Or do you think that's not a valid concern? No, I think that's a very valid concern. But um, because this ties in very deeply with exploration, this also ties in that prior knowledge actually helps us explore the environment efficiently. And if we don't have any good prior knowledge to base upon, our exploration is haywire, which means that we'll become less curious and probably more bored of that game. Okay, let's thank our speaker again. Okay, the next speaker is Alex Erpen, who's gonna tell us whether deep reinforcement learning can solve Erdo Selfridge Spencer games. All right, hi, uh, I'm Alex, and yeah, that's our paper title. Uh, so deep reinforcement learning research has seen uh, a lot of buzz in the past few years. However, there are still quite a few challenges in it. So one of them is instability to random seeds. Uh, what I'm showing here in these two GIFs is that it's the same RL algorithm in the same environment with the same hyperparameters and the only difference is the random seed used. And as we see, we end up learning very qualitatively different behavior. Uh, so sort of the downside of this means that in order to benchmark our RL algorithms, we're going to need to run them several times. Uh, another challenge in deep reinforcement learning is generalization, where in uh, a lot of benchmarks, we're always training by collecting data on one task and then evaluating by running in the same task where we collected data in, which I think is perfectly fine, but also if we want to apply reinforcement learning to real world problems, we're going to eventually need to be able to handle out of distribution inputs in a nice way. So in this paper, then we propose a new test bed, which is based on Erdos Selfred Spencer games. Uh, these are games from the combinatorial math literature. They were created by Joel Spencer and they have links to the work of Paul Erdos and John Lewis Selfridge. And it's going to have these three nice properties for us. So one, it's going to be a two-player game. Uh, uh, I'll talk a bit later about how this lets us explore generalization and multi-agent training. Another thing is that these games are going to have a closed form optimal policy, which is going to be linear in our state representation. And the third property, which I find the most interesting, is that the game has difficulty parameters which let us tune how hard it is to solve the problem. So to briefly explain how the game works, it's called the attacker defender game. And we're going to essentially have a large number of pieces scattered across k plus one different levels, which are labeled from zero to k. There are two agents, the attacker agent and the defender agent. The attacker agent's goal is to get at least one piece to the final level. And the defender's goal is to try to destroy all of the pieces before this happens. And the way the game is played is that the attacker proposes a partition of the pieces into two sets. And then the defender will choose one set to destroy, and every piece in the other set moves up one level. So to talk a little bit about the first property, what we're going to do in most of this paper is we're going to fix the attacker behavior to be optimal, treat it as part of the environment, and then train the defender using reinforcement learning. Now, the nice thing of doing this is that because it's a two-player game, there are a wide variety of attackers you can use. So if you train against one fixed attacker, but then evaluate in an environment that is run against another attacker, you automatically get something where your environment depends on your attacker. So we can very easily get different environments to test generalization. And we can also explore multi-agent learning problems a bit as well. Uh, as for the optimal policy, uh, I'm not going to get into the details too much. If you're interested, you can come see our poster. But the, the very short version is that if you scale the number, if you multiply the number of pieces in each level by some appropriate power of two, then you can prove that assuming optimal play, the defender is guaranteed to win if the potential of a state is less than one, where the potential is defined as this weighting of the pieces. And the attacker can win if the potential is greater than or equal to one. Uh, but the other important thing is that this potential function acts as a measure of difficulty. 
where the closer the potential is to one, the fewer mistakes the defender is allowed to make before it's guaranteed to fail at the game. Uh, the other way we can tune difficulty is we can increase the number of levels K, which will increase the size of our state and also increase the length of our episode, which will make our reward more sparse. And the nice thing of this is that uh, if your RL algorithm always fails or always succeeds, you can't really do anything about comparing different algorithms, but if you can sort of tune your environment to the sweet spot where some succeed and some don't, then you can start saying things about which RL algorithms seem to be more powerful than other ones. So this leaves evaluating different deep RL algorithms, and for this, we mostly used implementations which are in OpenAI baselines. And what we found was that comparing uh, A2C, PPO, and DQN, then uh, for one, the reward tends to match our notion of difficulty, where we evaluated a uh, defender for varying levels of potential, and as our potential gets closer to one, then we do empirically see that reward of our agents are going down. So this backs up uh, the math uh, behind the game. And additionally, we do see that the problem is non-trivial on that algorithms have different levels of performance on it, which is good news in that it means that this is actually like a somewhat worthwhile test bed to start exploring things on. Uh, another thing that we looked into was generalization. So what I'm showing in this plot here is uh, in the blue curve, we're training a defender agent against the optimal attacker and then evaluating against the optimal attacker. And in the, on the orange curve, we're training against the optimal attacker, but then evaluating against a different attacker. Uh, we call it the disjoint support one. And what we see is that there's this generalization gap. And one thing I'd like to point out is that this is happening even though our attacker agent that we're evaluating against is not optimal. So this really suggests that what seems to be happening is some sort of overfitting to states and not really like a lot of general understanding of how to play the game. Uh, as I said before, we're also looking into multi-agent training. And what we see when we do multi-agent training is that we generally get better generalization, where here the orange curve is the multi-agent. Uh, reward value and the blue curve is the one where we only train against the fixed attacker. Uh, our explanation for this is that this has to do with seeing more diverse states when the attacker is learned against your defender. Uh, we don't have an analysis of this in the paper, but we've been doing a little bit of work and it seems to uh, back things up and you can come talk to me later for more details. Uh, we also looked into self-play because self-play has basically seemed to be very successful for several groups. And we also get similar success where if we represent the attacker and defender within a single network, then we very quickly seem to reach episode reward one, which indicates the defender winning almost all the time. And additionally, when we inspected the weights, then they actually did match up with what the optimal weights are according to the math theory. So in these experiments alone, then it seems like the agent actually learned something which will generalize to any possible attacker and has learned the optimal behavior. Uh, the final experiment I'd like to talk about is comparing reinforcement learning to supervised learning. I guess you can, by supervised learning, I really sort of mean behavioral cloning, where we know what the optimal action is in every state. So what we did was we would collect a batch of states and then train a supervised learning agent to maximize its accuracy on predicting the correct move. So what we see here is that supervised learning picks the optimal move more often, which is the accuracy, which is shown in the left graph here. But in the right graph here is episode reward, and our reinforcement learning agent actually receives higher reward when playing the game. So this is a little bit interesting, and our explanation ties into what we define as fatal mistakes. And these are times when the agent makes an incorrect move, and it brings it from a state where it was guaranteed to win assuming optimal play to a state where it's guaranteed to lose assuming optimal play. And what we see is that supervised learning performs a lot more fatal mistakes than reinforcement learning does. And what this suggests is that although reinforcement learning maybe has less accuracy overall, it seems to have more accuracy on the states which actually matter for a final episode reward and seems to be sort of, in some sense, focusing its optimization power on doing these states well. Uh, so that's it, and I'd like to thank the collaborators, and we also have our code on GitHub if you'd like to play with these environments yourself. Thank you. Okay, we have a couple minutes for questions. Please make your way to the mic. So I have a question. Um, so one implication of your approach is that it's easier to test for generalization 
uh, ability by monkeying with the uh, opponent than it is by monkeying with the environment itself. It's not clear to me why that's the case. Like in a robotics task, I can play with the coefficient of friction or other things that will clearly be correlated with difficulty without needing a multi-agent approach. Right, so I, I suppose that for how the game works, then it's a little tricky to change the mechanics of what exact, how exactly the defender is allowed to destroy pieces or remove other pieces. And I do agree that in like some robotics tasks, you can sort of uh, change like physics parameters and this will let you get different environments as well. So I, I suppose the argument is that it's not that you can't test generalization in other environments, it's more that this is another way you can view uh, how to get uh, a distribution of environments by doing two player setups and then having one of them be fixed. Time for one more very quick question, anyone? Okay, let's thank our speaker again. Okay, our next speaker is Cedric Kola, who will tell us about decoupling exploration and exploitation in deep reinforcement learning. Okay, so should I stay or should I go? Should I keep doing what I currently think is best or should I become a rolling stone in the hope of finding better options? This, this is famously known as the, the clash between exploration and exploitation. So today I'll claim that we can tackle the problem of exploration in reinforcement learning by decoupling a pure exploration from a subsequent gradient-based uh, uh, policy search. So here's the typical diagram again. Uh, we have an agent, here a little car, that performs action inside an environment, here the mountain car problem, and receives information about its current state and reward. So given the current state, the agent can compute the next action to perform uh, using a policy. In this case, it's a neural net. So policy search is all about finding good policy parameters that will generate a behavior that maximizes the performance. So the performance is basically the sum of rewards over an episode. So to do that, we need a learning algorithm. So deep reinforcement learning algorithm in particular uh, have shown impressive results in the past years and are really efficient in performing gradient descent in reinforcement learning uh, settings. So that's why we chose a deep deterministic policy gradient, so DDPG for short. So here is how it works. Uh, after each step in the environment, it stores a transition made of the previous state, the action, the subsequent state and rewards into a replay buffer, which is basically a memory. After end of those steps, it samples a batch of those transitions and use them to update uh, its two neural nets. So the first network is called the critic. It estimates the, the, the value, the Q value, of performing a given action in a given state. So in front of a cliff, it would typically be the one saying that pressing the accelerator is not the, the best idea you can have. The other neural net is the actor. It implements the policy, so it maps the, the current state to the next action. It drives the car. So the DPG uh, follows basically the, the gradient of performance to, to update the actor. So why would we need uh, exploration in the end? Um, Gradient-based methods are known to be sensitive to uh, the initial policy and to situations in which the gradient is either flat or deceptive. So if we take an example, the continuous mountain car example here, uh, we have an underpowered car that has to swing up and down the hill to reach the top here. So reaching the top triggers a strong positive reward, but every small movement triggers a small penalty for energy expenses. So until the top is reached for the first time, the DPG can only learn from the negative rewards. So it learns to avoid them, which leads to some kind of local optimum, which is the no action policy. It does not move, basically. So we call this a deceptive gradient because it points toward this uh, local optimum. So in this case, we'd like to explore further from this local optima to get out of it. So there are several ways to explore in reinforcement learning. Uh, usually we add some kind of noise on the actions or more efficiently directly on the, on the policy parameters. But either way, it's a random and local exploration around the current policy. So in our case, around the policy of, the policy of no action. So here, this would typically not work in this setting in CMC because here we want to explore far from this uh, local optima. We want to be able to reach that goal. So we want exploration that is irrespective of performance. 
So to do that, we could use a pure exploration algorithm that does not take into account any, uh, any function of the reward, any reward. And, and to do that, we, need, uh, we can use the goal exploration process that we call JEP for short. So how it works is that it samples a policy from a parameter space, then it plays it in the environment, which leads to a trajectory. Then we map this trajectory inside an outcome space by extracting a behavioral feature. Uh, so in CMC, we could use the minimum and maximum positions along the x-axis as two behavioral uh, features described in the trajectory. So once we have that, we can store the new pair of policy and outcome in memory, and then we repeat those steps. So when we sample the policy at random, it's basically random policy search. But that, that's not what JEP is doing. Here we sample a self-generated uh, goal in the outcome space. Then to reach it, we uh, retrieve the policy that corresponds to the nearest outcome already experienced, this one there. Uh, finally, we play a variant of this policy, which leads to a new outcome here. And we store the new pair in memory. So repeating those steps, um, so self-generating goals and trying to reach them, we build some kind of population of diverse solutions. In the environment Archida, we can use the average velocity and uh, the minimum height of the head as two behavioral features. And so using a simple uh, nearest neighbor search in the, the memory of past outcomes, uh, we can easily retrieve uh, specific and uh, diverse policies, such as running forward, running backward, uh, getting on, on the back, and so forth. So now how do we combine the pure exploration of JEP and the efficient gradient descent of the DPG? We implemented a simple um, transfer of samples. So first we run a few episodes of JEP. So it's some kind of unsupervised learning driven by the maximization of uh, behavioral uh, diversity. We store the trajectories inside the replay buffer. And in a second step, we start learning with DDPG from scratch, so from randomly initialized networks. But using this uh, replay buffer that already contains a rich uh, collection, a rich and diverse collection of, of experience. So we hope that this diverse experience can help uh, DDPG overcome exploration problems, such as the deceptive gradient. So we call this whole uh, algorithm uh, JPG for JEP policy gradient. So here we compare uh, JEPPG and DDPG. Um, when DDPG implements also uh, some kind of local exploration, uh, so either on the action or on the parameters. And we see here that, uh, yep, not working. That DDPG alone uh, has a performance of zero, which means that the, it falls into the deceptive trap. The agent is not moving at all. So when we do some kind of uh, par par perturbation on the parameters, we explore a bit better in light red, and so we reach a bit higher performance. But now, if we look at uh, the expression algorithm alone, uh, JEP in green, uh, we see that it learns the task almost instantly. So this means that the task is really, really simple, as long as you're not uh, taking care, uh, not being fooled by the deceptive gradient. So now, when we combine the two, uh, we first follow the JEP learning curve, then we switch here to the DPG, we learn from scratch. Uh, we reach high performing policies quite fast, although we kind of forget them afterwards, which might still be a problem of the deceptive gradient. So here we see the distribution of the best policy performance uh, across different trials, and we can see that uh, JPG in dark red and dark blue uh, find high performing policies uh, much more consistently than the DDPG, DDPG counterparts. So now, uh, quickly on Hachida. Um So there is no obvious exploration problem, so no obvious deceptive gradient, although and th th there might still be. Um, but we can still see that uh, JPG uh, in dark red and dark blue uh, outperform their uh, DDPG counterparts uh, and also show uh, lesser variance. So finally, uh, the pure exploration algorithm here um, shows quite poor performance. So here we see that it shows lesser variance, and here we have a, a good performing policy. So finally, uh, the take home messages are that DDPG, which is a state of the art algorithm, uh, fails on CMC uh, because of the deceptive gradient issue, but that the idea of decoupling a pure exploration uh, by self generation of goals and a subsequent uh, gradient descent um, can help uh, overcome this, uh, this kind of problems. 
So it helps in uh, continuous smart and car, and it helps uh, improve performance on the Hapchita as well. So thank you for your time. Um, I'm not sure, I'm, I don't know if we have many, much time to, for questions, but I'll be there for the post session. Was there 174, and you can also drop me an email later. Thanks. We do have one minute for questions. Uh, if you want to walk to the mic. Hello? Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you for the presentation. That was really nice. I was curious, though. I mean, it seems rather sample and efficient in that you do this exploration, throw away the whole model, and then learn another model. And then on Half Cheetah, you showed the learning curves being better than the, the naive way. But are you taking into account the samples you observed during that first learning trait? Yeah, uh, phase? That, that's the learning curve I showed. So the, the first pass is the exploration algorithm. So you see the samples used by the exploration algorithm. And basically what, what I plot is like, I, at each moment I test this exploration algorithm on the, the task uh, reward, on the task. Uh, yeah, the uh, task. Okay, so even though you're like throwing away a model and retraining, you still use less overall samples than DDPG yeah, would yeah, use yeah. to get there. Oh, yeah. cool, that's really nice, thanks. I'm sorry, that's all the time we have. Sorry, Rich. <laughs> um, are you uh, ready? Okay, the next speaker is Fabio Pardo, who will tell us about time limits in reinforcement learning. All right, good afternoon. My name is Fabio Pardo. I'm going to present a joint work with Arash Tavakoli, Vitaly Levtik, and Peter Kormushev about time limits in reinforcement learning. So first, what do we mean by time limit? It's the maximum number of time steps per episode. So your agent is interacting with its environment, and after a few number of time steps, you terminate the episode and you restart mm -hmm. a new one. So it appears that most reinforcement learning experiments use a time limit. For example, all OpenAI gym environments are time limited. However, we found that um, it's actually, it, there, there is a, a common misunderstanding about the role of time limits mm -hmm. in reinforcement learning. So first, let's focus on time-limited tasks. So here, um, time limits apply naturally because uh, you have a fixed number of time steps to interact with your environment and maximize your return. So in time-limited environments, the state transition distribution is time-dependent because your environment has to terminate after t time steps, so it means that your uh, state transition distribution has a notion of time, right? So your MDP has time in the state. However, most of the time, in reinforcement learning experiments, time is not part of the observations. And this means that the environment is now partially observable. And in some cases, for example, if you have a very simple task like this MDP where you have to jump just before the time limit, it's very obvious that you need time to perform well. But it's maybe less obvious that actually if the environment, if you don't have, observe, if you don't have time in your observation, actually the environment seems non-stationary as the termination distribution changes with the behavioral policy. So let's say your agent is exploring some part of the environment and you have timeout termination in this part of the environment and later it starts to shift to another part of the environment, then you have new timeout termination in this part and no more in the other one. So actually it looks like the environment is non-stationary to the agent. So let's uh, take a very simple example. Let's take uh, standard queue learning with no time in the observation. So it means that um, the target for the, the queue update is at all termination, including timeouts, you will not bootstrap, otherwise you will bootstrap. So let's take a very simple grid world where you can start in each of the dots. You have three time steps to interact with your environment. You have a penalty for each movement and you have two uh, terminal goals with 50 and 20 uh, rewards. So this is what happens when you apply Q-learning without including time in input. You have this suboptimal policy that doesn't learn, for example, to stay in place when it doesn't have enough time to reach the goal. Okay, so let's fix this. Let's add time in input. So for a tabular Q-learning, it means that you actually have t times more possible observation now, but for 
a very simple case like this one is, is still tractable. And this is the policy that you learn, which is uh, clearly optimal, right? Now, for um, other kind of tasks, like Mujoko tasks, what you can do is to simply concatenate a scalar to your input vector. And this actually improves a lot. These are very uh, uh, out-of-the-shelf um, Mujoko tasks in OpenAI Gym. Just by adding the remaining time in input, you actually see that blue, which is time-aware PPO, most of the time outperforms standard PPO. And the value functions that are learned are um, appropriately learning to decay the return towards the end of the episode. And something interesting that you can also see is that when you have no discount, so that's the bottom part of the graphs, um, the gap between time-aware and non-time-aware PPO is even larger. And we, we think that this is because um, you have to learn a kind of average value if you don't have time in input. And the, the, the error between the return that you experience and this kind of average are even bigger when you don't have any discount. So now, there is actually an issue if you do time limit and, for example, you use uh, time awareness, which is you can have a kind of photo finish behavior. Your agent is really trying to optimize for the time limit, so it will, for example, jump at the end of the episode to maximize the distance. And this is probably not what you want to do for a locomotion task, right? You probably want to learn a very efficient policy that can jump uh, indefinitely. So now let's take a look at time unlimited tasks. So here, you don't have a time limit that is part of the environment, meaning that you don't have time in the state of the MDP. So that's fine. You don't need to be time aware. However, something very important is because you can still use time limit to diversify experience. You don't want, for example, to be stuck in a corner in a room. You want to keep uh, having multiple diverse episodes. You can still use a time limit during training. But here, it's actually very important to understand that you need to keep to bootstrap at the end of your partial episode, meaning that the agent needs to understand that even if you reset the environment, there were more rewards to come. However, once more, this is not something that is uh, very frequent in reinforcement learning uh, experiments. And this can lead to um, low performing agents, and again, the same kind of non stationarity that we saw for uh, time limited environments. So let's take again very simple Q learning. This time we don't consider timeout termination as envir environmental termination, and we keep bootstrapping uh, when we do timeout uh, resets. On the right, you have the policy that is learned, which is optimal for a time unlimited task, which is trying to go for the most rewarding goal, even if during training it never experienced more than three time steps episodes. Okay, you can also apply this to, again, PPO. And for example, on Hopper and Walker, you can train with very, very short partial episodes, let's say 200 time steps, which corresponds to, for example, one or two seconds of interaction. And we show that you can actually learn a very robust policy that learns to hope for more than two hours. We actually have a video on YouTube that shows uh, the policy, even if it's not that interesting. So finally, we saw that for both cases, uh, you have the same kind of non-stationarity, right? Because again, uh, your agent interacts with the environment and it experiences timeout termination in different parts. And these timeout uh, terminations change with the behavior. And this actually is another problem. It doesn't work with experience replay. It makes your experiences obsolete. This is a simple task that is from a deeper look at experience replay from Zhang and Sutan. We took the exact same maze. So the agent starts on the dot and has to reach the red square. And they show that if you have a larger buffer, experience replay, the performance decreases. On the right, you can see uh, the distribution of uh, timeout terminations. And you can see that it changes with the behavior. And just by applying partial episode bootstrapping, we show that actually you almost have no effect. Finally, in conclusion, um, so we propose that when you use time limits, you have to use time awareness for time limited tasks and partial episode bootstrapping for time unlimited tasks. Mm -hmm. uh, the article, videos, and code are available on the website, and please come at our poster number 130. Thank you.
Okay, we have time for one or two questions. Yeah, go ahead. Hi. Uh, so you mentioned that the environment's non-stationary and that you add the time to the state because uh, it's partially observable. What would happen if you added like gamma to the t minus t times your value function? So now you're bootstrapping something like you would do with GAE normally. And then if you do that or if you go to the time infinity case, will your DQN learn to ignore the time that you put into the state? Because if you are in that time infinite environment, then time shouldn't matter anymore. So can the DQN learn that? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh is there a confusion between the time limited and time unlimited cases here? No, I'm asking if you bootstrap, then uh, do you find that the time doesn't matter anymore? So you mean for the time unlimited case, right? Yeah. So for time unlimited case, you don't want to provide time in input. Again, that's, that's a very different case. For time unlimited, you don't care about the time. Even if you reset during training, that's just a convenience during training. That's not something you want to learn for your policy. Uh, right. Okay, Rich, I think you wanted to ask a question? Yeah, very quickly. Uh, first, uh, thank you for this, this talk and this work. Uh, it's really good to get this cleared up so we can do good metho methodology. Um, and I want to also uh, talk about the time unlimited case when you're using partial episode bootstrapping. Um, I just wonder if you're aware that that makes it actually technically into an off policy situation and because you're cutting off an episode and not seeing the end of it. Um, no, actually, I don't see why you can't apply to uh, on policy methods such as PPO. Um, yeah, so this is a case where you would you would um, you would have the, the same potential as you do with all off policy learning that you might not uh, uh, diverge. You might not converge properly because you're, you're not seeing the end of the episode. Oh, right, yeah. Actually, one very important point about partial episode bootstrapping is you want to bootstrap from reliable values, right? So if, for example, you always start from the same point and you can only do a fixed number of time steps, then you will never go further away than some uh, points in the space. And then if you bootstrap from these points where you never experienced anything, you have a wrong value, and then this might be a, an issue. Maybe that's close to what you, you are trying to say. Yeah, it's really off policy situation. Thank you. Let's uh, thank our speaker again. Okay, the final speaker is Sam Gradanis, who will tell us about visualizing and understanding Atari agents. Uh, as soon as he gets his laptop working. Oh no. I'm sorry everybody for these technical issues. This is my first time presenting at a conference. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name is Sam Gradanis, and today I'll be presenting my ICML paper titled Visualizing and Understanding Atari Agents. I'd like to begin this talk by asking a question, which is, what are these agents doing? Well, I can tell you that they are trained using the A3C algorithm and that they obtain high rewards in their respective environments. If you look at these videos of their policy replays, you can see certain um, explanations. So perhaps the space invader agent is shooting at the aliens in order to achieve high rewards. Um, perhaps it's aiming, but perhaps it's just shooting upwards and getting lucky. The Pong agent, meanwhile, appears to have learned a kill shot in which it can deflect the ball at a perfect angle and obtain high rewards. But what would happen if it was put up against a different agent, a different hard-coded agent? In general, we can come up with hand-wavy explanations for what these agents are doing. But lack of satisfying explanations led us to develop a new tool which yields better insights about these agents. Our goal is to come up with a method that yields new insights about these agents, insights that couldn't come from just looking at the policy replays, catches bad agents um, or cheaters, 
and is also useful to non-experts in machine learning. We chose to investigate agents which learn policies from raw pixels, and in doing so, we decided to create saliency maps um, of the saliency of inputs rel related to the policy distribution and to the value network. Another decision we made was to treat the neural network as a black box. Next, we turned to computer vision literature, in which there is a great deal of research focused on generating saliency maps. One main method is to use gradient-based saliency. This exploits information from gradients to create a saliency map. And here are several methods listed. What we found when we did this with Atari agents is that gradients generally take us off the manifold of realistic images. In other words, gradients will um, talk about what maximally activates, say, the value function, um, but the gradient will be in sort of an unrealistic image space. For, so for example, if there's a ball at two different places, that might be very interesting to the value function. Um, so instead, we turn to perturbation-based saliency methods. And the idea here is to remove information from the input without adding new information. Um, so a lot of times, this involves masking part of the input and removing that area and seeing how the outputs of the model change. And this is done in Fong and Vidaldi and several other papers. Um, here's the equation that we use. And here's an example of it being applied to an input to an uh, A3C agent. And we're basically interpolating between the regular pre-processed frame and a blurred version of that frame using a Gaussian to, uh, mask centered around pixels i and j. And the result is a locally perturbed version of the input. We then measure the difference um, in the output uh, activation of the policy distribution and the value network. So here's a comparison of the Jacobian and um, our method. And you can see that the saliency is much sharper. And, um, we're also displaying the saliency of the actor and the saliency of the critic, one in blue and one in red. So you can actually use these to create saliency videos. And here's an example. You can see that throughout several frames, the uh, value network attends generally to the location in which the tunnel is forming, uh, which makes sense as it helps predict future high rewards. And meanwhile, the policy distribution attends mostly to uh, the paddle and the ball. So this is interesting. Um, there's still some artifacts, but creating a policy video is much more difficult to, say, hand pick. Um, and it demonstrates that our method works well enough to follow over multiple time steps. So what sort of insights can this method give us? Well, one is that the space invader agent is indeed aiming at uh, specific agents, specific aliens. So on the top frame, you can see the circled alien. Um, it actually has a slight amount of um, saliency for the policy distribution around it. Several time steps later, the agent fires a bullet. And then several time steps after that, um, the same alien is then highlighted in red as the value network um, anticipates a reward. And you can see this happen again and again. Another thing we noticed is that the Pong agent generally does not concentrate saliency around its opponent's paddle at all when making a kill shot. Um, and this suggests that it's sort of memorized or overfit to the hard-coded opponent strategy, or maybe knows where the paddle is. Um, so we, we hypothesize that it would not do well against um, a, a different type of hard-coded agent, say. Another thing we can do is visualize learning over the course of um, training. And we here we did this with a Space Invaders agent and saw that saliency generally, generally focuses in the immediate vicinity of the agent during early training. This makes sense as the agent could avoid incoming bullets and maybe, say, find protection in the shields. But later in training, around frames 30 million and 40 million, we begin to see saliency focus on uh, enemies, which presumably would be used for uh, aiming. The next thing we wanted to do was catch some cheaters. But the first thing we had to do was create some cheaters. The way we did this was to intentionally train an agent to cheat using hint pixels. What this is, is we took the policy distribution of an agent that achieves high rewards in the environment, an expert, and we encoded that policy in uh, the hint pixel shown here. For control agent, we also assigned random values to these hint pixels. Results are so shown here. The control agent um, generally does not center saliency around the hint pixels at all, whereas the cheaters, uh, most of the saliency is focused around the hint pixels. This demonstrates that our method can catch the cheaters. Um, it's important to note that both of these agents achieve high rewards in their environment, and their policies are nearly indistinguishable without saliency, as they're both trained to mimic the same expert agent. Next, we um, sought to show that our method was applicable to um, non-experts. And we did a quick survey of, several of a group of undergraduates at Oregon State University, showing video rollouts um, of both the control agents and the cheater agents. 
In one case, it was just a video, and distinguishing between the two types of agents was difficult. Meanwhile, for the video plus saliency, um, the respondents without a machine learning background were generally able to tell, to tell the difference. In conclusion, we've introduced a perturbation-based saliency technique for explaining deep RL agents. We've shown that it yields new insights that we cannot gain simply from watching the policy rollouts, it catches cheaters, and it's useful to non-experts. We'd like to remark that truly satisfying explanations will combine several tools, and we hope that this is one. Thanks. Uh, any questions? We have time for a couple questions. Uh, with your breakout video early on, the, there was a, a phenomenon where the actor and the critic were alternating in their attention on the ball. Any idea what was causing that? Yeah, um, we're actually not sure about that, and it could very much just be an artifact. So um, that's definitely something we should investigate more. Any other questions? Hello. Thank you for the great talk. So I see that you can uh, visualize uh, uh, the importance in the state, but uh, have you ever thought of like uh, to visualize why this action is better than the other? Um, as in visualizing a particular action as opposed to a different action? Um, as in where, where the saliency would be for two different actions? Yeah, so right, um, so why is this action, for example, like uh, when in the game of Pong, why is going up is better than going down? Uh, is that, uh, can be visualized, and I want to know your insight about it. Uh, I suppose you could create a saliency map as we did um, in this case, uh, but that involves a bit more counterfactual reasoning over a longer horizon than frame by frame, uh, so that might be difficult. Okay, let's thank our speaker again. That's the end of the session. Thank you all for coming. expecting to chair this session, but no one else seems to be here, so we'll just continue. Uh, the next speaker is George Tucker, who will talk about the mirage of action-dependent baselines and reinforcement learning. Thank you. So yeah, I'm, I'm George Tucker, and I'll be talking about our work on uh, action-dependent baselines, and this is joint work with Surya, Shane, and Professors Turner, 
Garami, Garamani, and Levin. So I'll just first start with our main results. What we found was that on common continuous control benchmarks, action-dependent baselines negligibly reduce variance. And furthermore, we found that positive results in prior works can be attributed to implementation errors that traded variance for bias rather than unbiased variance reduction as claimed in the papers. So I'll first start with motivation and background on why we're interested in action-dependent baselines and more generally understanding the sources of variance in policy gradient estimators and then move on to our decomposition of variance and the numerical experiments that support the conclusions that we found. And then finally, I'll end with implementation pitfalls that we discovered as we were conducting this work. So in RL, we uh, want the awesome fist pumping action that we have on the left, but usually we end up with something that's more like on the right. And why is that? Why is RL hard? Um, one reason is long-term credit assignment. Um, methods like TRPO and PPO use on-policy Monte Carlo estimates of the returns, and these can be high variance but low bias. As a result, TRPO and PPO provide stable learning, but at the cost of large batch sizes to reduce the high variance in the gradient estimators, resulting in high sample complexity. What we wondered is, does it have to be this way? Is there some way that we can reduce the variance of these gradient estimators without compromising the underlying stability of the method? So now I'll just briefly review the main ideas in policy gradient methods. We're trying to optimize the um, expected discounted return, which I've denoted as J, and that's the expected value of the sum of discounted future rewards. Here I've denoted the starting state S, action, and then I've abbreviated the rest of the trajectory with tau. For convenience, I'll define the Q function. It's the um, expected discounted return, given that we start in state S and take action A and then follow policy pi. And then we have the value function, which is the expected value of the Q function with respect to the policy. And then the advantage function is the difference between the Q function and the value function. And it represents the, how much better an action is over the typical action from that state. And the policy gradient theorem allows us to take the gradient of J and express it as an expectation of the Q function times the gradient of the log probability of the policy. And this is convenient because it allows us to estimate the gradient with samples from the environment without having knowledge of the environment dynamics. We can subtract a constant or baseline that depends only on the state without affecting the expectation. In this case, I've subtracted the value function, which depends only on the state. And we do this because subtracting a baseline can reduce the variance. And this is a well-known result. And here I've just plotted, um, as we train a policy on a continuous control task, in this case humanoid, um, I plotted the variance of the policy gradient estimator at different time points and the variance is on a log scale. And you can see that the blue line with no baseline has extremely high variance. If we use a learned state baseline, in this case a value function, the gradient variance is greatly reduced. And this is um, very appealing because we've reduced the variance of the gradient estimator without introducing any bias. Action-dependent baselines are a recent um, extension of baselines that introduce the action into the baseline as well. And this is an area of uh, active work in the past couple of years. And the promise has been variance reduction and performance improvement without adding any bias to the gradient. And in a recent paper, they compare a state baseline to a state action baseline and the state baseline is, would be this top curve, and the state action baseline is this, 
bottom curve, and you can see that there's a huge improvement in variance, over a million X reduction in variance um, over the state-only baseline. And now you might be suspicious of this because we're talking about a situation where the rewards are over hundreds of time steps, and I'm telling you that by adding just a single action that that can reduce the variance by a million times. And as we'll see, that is not correct. So now I'll describe how we approach the problem and just go over what I specifically mean by an action-dependent baseline. So we have our policy gradient estimator. Here I've replaced the advantage function with an estimate of the advantage function a hat that depends on the state action and rest of the trajectory. And with an action-dependent baseline, we subtract the action-dependent baseline from the advantage estimator and add a bias correction term. And we need the bias correction term because now the baseline depends on the action. If the baseline only depended on the state, the second term would be zero. When pi is reparameterizable, the second term can be estimated efficiently. And also, if the action space is discrete and small enough, we can estimate the integral exactly. Now, the main questions are, what is the effect of this action-dependent baseline on the variance? And more generally, are there other sources of variance that we should be looking at that might be more important? So the gradient estimator depends on three random variables, the state, the action, and then the rest of the trajectory. And we can decompose the variance of this gradient estimator into three terms, which roughly correspond to those three random variables. So first, we have a term that roughly corresponds to tau, the rest of the trajectory. And then the second term, which corresponds to the action. And then the third term, which corresponds to the state. And the important thing to note is that the action-dependent baseline only shows up in the second term. And furthermore, an optimal action-dependent baseline would reduce that second term, which I've denoted as sigma a, to zero. So the key question just is, what are the relative magnitudes of these terms? Because if sigma a is dominated by the other, any of the other two terms, then regardless of how good a baseline we have, it won't make a difference on the total overall variance. To quantify this, we started with a strong TRPO baseline and then numerically evaluated these variance terms on Majoko and LQR systems. I'm only going to show you results from um, half cheetah tasks, but the results on other tasks are similar, and you can refer to the paper for the full details. We evaluated these with naive return estimators and generalized advantage estimator, which is more commonly used. Um, we also evaluated under both Oracle and learned baseline conditions. And here I've defined what I mean by Oracle baselines. It's just taking the advantage estimator and integrating out some of the random variables. The interesting thing is that in these complex environments, computing these integrals is intractable, but we can still actually form unbiased estimates of the variance of these when we're using these oracle things, even though we don't actually have access to the oracles themselves. So here I've plotted um, the variance. Again, it's variance at different points during the training um, run, and then the variance is on a log scale. And so the first term, this uh, variance term that corresponds to the rest of the trajectory is in blue. And these two middle terms are different choices of baselines and the variance term corresponding to the action. And then finally, we have the variance term corresponding to the uh, state. So I've just kind of tried to summarize the results here. If we have no baseline, then we would add all three terms and, and we would be using the no baseline sigma a term. And you can see, as we saw before, no baseline has extremely high variance. If we use the Oracle state baseline, the variance is greatly reduced. 
and we can see that the dominating term of the variance is actually the first term. So regardless of the fact that uh, if we used an optimal state action baseline, we would only be able to eliminate the variance coming from this sigma a term, and it wouldn't have a large effect on the total variance. Again, remember this is a log scale, so this uh, gold curve is quite a bit smaller than the dark blue curve. Now we looked at the case with learned state and state action baselines. This is more of the practical case that we would actually encounter. And what we find is that the learned baselines are actually quite similar. So I've plotted them in red and purple. You can see them here. They lie on top of each other, essentially. The other thing to note is that both are far from optimal, suggesting that there's significant room for improvement with even just the state baseline if we could get closer to the oracle performance of the state baseline. Finally, we can do the same analysis with uh, generalized advantage estimators um, for the advantage function. And we also find that the learned baselines are similar. Again, they lie on top of each other. And they're, again, far from optimal. So the learned state baseline is here, and the optimal or oracle state baseline, I mean, is here. And you can see there's a large difference in variance that would be possible if we could get closer to the oracle state baseline. Um, finally, just a note that, um, as we can see, generalized advantage functions significantly reduce that first variance term. OK. So how do these results kind of, how are they consistent with previous work? Previous work was saying that by using these um, action-dependent baselines, they got better results. They showed better improved performance. So how does that square with the results that I'm showing you now? So I'll talk about what implementation issues um, cause the improved performance. So normalizing the advantage estimator with doing mean and variance normalization is fairly common, but it's a little bit more tricky when you have this um, action-dependent baseline. So in QProp, um, they accidentally omitted the scaling term on the uh, bias correction term in their code. So here's the estimator that's actually implemented and was used for the experiments in the paper. And you see it's missing the scaling term on the second term. And because sigma is typically larger than 1, this has the effect of downweighting the first term, which is the high variance term. So effectively, it acts as an adaptive bias variance trade-off. And if we implement QProp as presented in the paper, that's the red line, we see that it doesn't outperform TRPO. That's the blue line. However, this effect, this uh, adaptive bias variance trade-off actually performs quite a bit better than um, TRPO. That's the green line. And I think this deserves uh, future investigation into how we can do this adaptive bias variance trade-off in a controlled way. Um, the other potential pitfall is that the update order um, of the gradient and the baseline makes a difference. So if we update the baseline first, this introduces a statistical uh, dependence on the future trajectory that's not accounted for in the bias correction term. And this fitting of the uh, baseline on the current batch actually introduces a very complicated bias variance trade-off, which in some cases leads to unstable behavior, for example, on this half-cheetah task. But on some, in some cases, the bias variance trade-off works in your favor, and on humanoid, it improves performance. However, it's a challenging um, thing to analyze and would be hard to control in practice. So going back to our variance plots, what we saw was that the learned state baseline was actually very far from the oracle state baseline. So this suggests why don't we just try to improve the learned state baseline? So as a proof of concept to suggest that focusing on the most important thing is the right thing to do, we looked at just what's a simple modification to the value function that we could do to improve it. And 
Um, actually, very similar to the time limits uh, paper that was presented earlier, we looked at how we could correct for finite horizon episodes. So naturally, when you have a finite horizon episode, the value declines at the end of an episode. And to account for this, we parameterize the value function with discounted time left explicitly. So we predict a reward rate and multiply it by the discounted time left. You could also feed the discounted time into the value function uh, and hope that the neural network will just do the right thing. And that's also a very reasonable thing. We compare that approach as well. So the red, uh, the blue line is just standard value baseline. The red line is the value w with input uh, time left. And then the green line is our horizon aware value baseline. And we found that um, that performed the best by explicitly modeling the dependence of time on the value function. And we find, as you might expect, that this actually improves performance. And so I've plotted various versions of TRPO and our horizon aware value function TRPO that uses that horizon aware value parameterization um, in red, and it improves across tasks. Finally, just in conclusion, we decompose the variance of policy gradient estimators and numerically evaluate these variance terms in common Majoko domains and find that action dependence does not help. However, I want to stress that in other domains, action dependence in the baseline can be extremely helpful. Um, so when you think about a case where a single action makes a huge impact on future returns. For example, like a cliff world where falling off the cliff is hugely detrimental to your future reward. This is a case where we expect that action-dependent baselines would be helpful. And then lastly, we revealed several implementation choices that introduced bias for variance. And we definitely think this is, would be an interesting area for future work to understand how we can do this in a controlled fashion. Um, if you want to talk about this, I'll be at the posters tonight, uh, poster number 30. And thank you. OK, we have a couple minutes for questions. Please walk to the mic if you have a question. Hi there. Um, thanks for the talk. That was very interesting. A um, couple of quick questions. So um, the first question was, you know, you decomposed nicely into these three variance terms. The fact that the variance of the remaining trajectory um, tends to be so high suggests that an alternative to finding a really accurate baseline would be bootstrapping. And I was wondering if you'd consider that in your analysis. Yeah, so I think you could kind of think about um, the GAE estimator as some kind of bootstrapped estimator. I mean, the lambda or the tau and GAE controls like is going to control that bias variance trade-off in that estimator. And you could see that in the plots with GAE, it's greatly reducing that like first term. Um, so so does, GAE exactly does it. I guess I, I just missed the plot where you were actually analyzing that. So if it was there, sorry. I oh, missed yeah. That. Yeah, it, it's pretty quick. But it's also in the paper. We have all the plots with GAE as well. And then just briefly, I think the, the point you made about um, the, the, this approximation of the value function is quite closely related to natural value function approximation, um, which is a, it uses a similar idea of scaling the value function according to the discounting. So, OK, uh, thank you. Anyway, thanks. Very nice. Time for one more quick question. Oh, I wonder if you could just quickly uh, remind us of the uh, motivation for, for, for having an action-dependent discount, uh, action-dependent baseline. What's the intuition? Um, well, the idea is that you want to, I mean, I got, the way I think about it is that um, we can, comp with the action-dependent baseline, it's kind of like a model or it's like a model of the Q function. And the thing is that we can compute um, the gradient in two different ways for that thing. We can compute the reinforced gradient and we can compute the reparameterization gradient. And if I can, 
so uh, since I have two different ways of estimating this gradient, if one of them's lower variance, I can kind of fall back on that one. So I'm going to take as much of my um, complicated reinforced gradient policy gradient term and move it into this thing that I can do reparameterization gradient on, which will be low variance. Okay, let's thank our speaker again. Okay, and the next speaker is Ophir, who's going to tell us about smooth action value functions. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, so I uh, conducted this research about smooth action value functions with my collaborators at Google Brain. Uh, so when, when we started this research, uh, we started very simply. We, uh, defined, we started by defining a new notion of Q values, a new notion of action values, which we defined as simply taking the expected Q values, the sort of standard salsa Q values, and just applying a, a very simple Gaussian smoothing. And although we defined them rather simply, uh, as we studied them more and more closely, we, we found more and more interesting properties, all sorts of very neat mathematical identities that relate the smoothed action values to Gaussian policies in continuous control. And eventually, we built up enough of these uh, neat properties that we were able to devise a new reinforcement learning algorithm for learning Gaussian policies in continuous control that shows benefits over competing methods. And we affectionately call this algorithm smoothie. So I'll talk about all this and more, and I'll, I'll ho hopefully convince you that smooth Q values are, are really this, this very cool thing. Uh, but what I'll start with is a, a, uh, a motivating task. So I'll, I'll start with this motivating task, where uh, we'll see how standard policy gradient methods perform on this task, what their disadvantages are, and why smooth Q values would help here, and what smoothie does. So in this simple task, it's, a, it's just a one-shot task where uh, at each iteration, you choose some real number action, and you get a reward defined by this reward function that I've plotted here. Uh, and so the age-old question in reinforcement learning is first, what's the optimal policy? In this case, it's just choosing the action around 0.5 every time. But more importantly, how do you learn this optimal policy when all you have is trial and error interaction? Uh, and I should mention that I choose this simple task as a one-shot scenario because in this case, whenever we talk about Q values, we only talk about immediate rewards. So, so there's no sense of uh, future value, which makes it easier to understand. So first, uh, policy gradient, stochastic policy gradient, very popular. Uh, what it would do is first maintain a Gaussian policy using a mean parameter mu and a standard deviation sigma. At every iteration, it would choose some action sampled from its Gaussian. It would observe a reward R. And then it would update the mean and standard deviation parameters according to the reinforced equations. And what you should immediately notice about these updates is that there's a sigma, there's a standard deviation in the denominator, which means that as the standard deviation goes to zero, which is unfortunately inevitable once you converge to the optimal policy, the, the variance of these stochastic updates could be quite high. And so that's the main downside of using stochastic policy gradient. And people have found all sorts of ways around this by using large batch sizes or variance reduction, possible policy methods. Uh, but the variance reduction, the variance issue with these noisy stochastic updates is really a, a very uh, important issue. Uh, and one possible uh, way to remedy the variance issue, which is the key to deterministic policy gradient, or DDPG, is to somewhat unintuitively push the standard deviation all the way to zero. So in DDPG, you maintain a deterministic policy where you only care about the mean, mu, uh, and you also have a Q value function parameter, Q pi, which in our case will be learned to just uh, approximate this reward function. And so at each iteration, you choose some action A, you observe the reward R, you update your Q value approximator based on this new experience, and then you can update the mean uh, very uh, succinctly in terms of the gradient of the Q value approximator. And so this is pretty neat, because now we actually have deterministic updates to the policy that uh, don't rely on any sort of stochastic sampling of the action. And so that's the main advantage of the DPG, that it removes all the noisy uh, updates associated with stochastic policy gradient. But of course, it has many downsides. So since we're learning a deterministic policy, there's no sense of exploration, which means we, our exploration strategy is just this, this synthetic noise. Uh, there's also poor support for proximal policy gradient methods. So in practice, DDPG is often more unstable than the very best stochastic methods. And then lastly, the shape of the Q-value function that we're learning is potentially very difficult to learn. Uh, and it can also lead to bad or suboptimal policy convergence. Like especially in the case I have here, 
uh, if I initialized my deterministic policy around minus 0.5 and I had a perfect Q value approximator, I would actually ne never find the optimal policy. I, I would be stuck in this suboptimal region. And so what we want us to do with Smoothie is think about how do we combine these, the advantages of these two approaches, right? We want to combine the deterministic policy updates associated with DDPG, but be able to apply those to a fully specified uh, Gaussian policy that allows us to do natural exploration, that allows us to do proximal policy methods, and has all these nice properties. And so what we realized, our key insight was that if we want to apply uh, DDPG-like updates to a fully specified Gaussian policy, then the Q-value approximator we really care about is actually a convolution of the uh, expected Q values, or the reward function in this case, uh, with the Gaussian. Right? If I convolve this reward function with a Gaussian, uh, with standard deviation given by, by my policy standard deviation, then the following function is exactly the expected reward function of my policy given a certain selected mean action. And so what you can immediately see is that the smooth Q values are first intuitively much easier to learn, right? Whenever you apply Gaussian smoothing to a function, you potentially remove discontinuities, you potentially remove uh, areas where the original function is non-differentiable. Secondly, you can always remove local optima, so especially in this case, we see that we actually uh, completely remove the effect of that uh, suboptimal region around minus 0.5. And as I'll show you, uh, updates to the mean and standard deviation of a Gaussian policy can be derived as deterministic updates based on the gradient and Hessian of a known smooth Q value. And so this is what smoothie would look like on this toy problem. So we'd maintain a Gaussian policy with a mu parameter and a sigma parameter, as well as a smooth Q value approximator. At every iteration, we'll choose some action sampled from our Gaussian, we'll observe a reward R, we'll update our Q value approximator based on this new experience, and then we'll update the mean. And the mean update will be very similar to DDPG. It's just, it's just based on the gradient of the smooth Q value. And this makes sense, right? We want to point, we want to move our mean in the direction of uh, maximizing expected reward. And very interestingly, and I'll show you the math behind this later, you can also derive an update to the standard deviation parameter. And interestingly, it, it comes out to be the Hessian of the smooth Q value. And so now we've uh, really achieved our, our goal, right? We've derive these deterministic updates, uh, there's no variance in them, uh, and we are still able to use a fully specified Gaussian policy. And so this was a, um, and, oh yeah, I'll show you uh, what smoothie looks like uh, on this toy task. In the bottom, I've plotted the mean and standard deviation of the Gaussian policy as I learn it on this toy task. And you can see I initialize it around the suboptimal region at minus 0.5. So you can see that the mean correctly learns to move away from this suboptimal region and towards the uh, optimum around 0.5. And you can also see very interestingly that the standard deviation uh, starts at quite high, but it initially decreases, then increases again before decreasing until it converges to that deterministic policy. And this makes sense because uh, this exactly corresponds to the shape of the smooth Q value function. It, it exactly corresponds to the convexity and concavity of the smooth Q value. Okay, so this was a very, uh, you know, motivational, intuitive introduction to Smoothie. Let me give you the more mathematical principled approach. So first, I'll introduce the expected Q values, the standard sort of Q value functions. So for a Gaussian policy specified by a mean function and a covariance function, the expected Q values are defined according to this Bellman equation. What they say is that for a state action pair, I'm going to define the expected Q value as the immediate reward associated with that state action pair, plus the expected future value of my next state, right? So these Q values basically encapsulate the notion of what's the expected future value of my policy if I start at this state S and I choose an initial action A. And we define them in this way because now the expected discounted future reward objective, which is the standard objective whenever you use policy grading, is very easy to express. It's simply the double integral over states and actions of the probability of sampling that action for my Gaussian policy times the expected Q value of that state action pair. And now the smooth Q values, like I said before, we define them as a Gaussian convolution of the expected Q values. So what this means is we take the expected Q values, which are a function of state and action, and we just apply a Gaussian convolution over the action argument. Well, that Gaussian uh, convolution has a covariance equal exactly to the covariance of our Gaussian policy. Another way you can look at the smooth Q values is that they answer the question, 
if I were to, well, they answer the question, what's the expected future value of my policy? If instead of sampling the first action from around my uh, mean mu, I instead sample it from around my, this counterfactual A, this mean action A. And one immediate advantage that we get from, these, from the smooth Q values is that now we can express the expected reward objective more simply. Right? We've changed a double integral into just a single integral. So the expected reward objective is just the single integral over all possible states of the smooth Q value at that state, given a mean action uh, specified by the mean function of our Gaussian policy. And now let me show you the first set of really cool uh, mathematical properties that smooth Q values have. So given knowledge of the smooth Q values, a Gaussian policy can be learned via deterministic updates. So when we learn a Gaussian policy, we care about learning the mean parameters and the covariance parameters uh, to maximize this expected reward objective. And so the mean parameters are, are quite easy to learn, right? I can differentiate both sides of this equation and move that gradient inside the integral, and I get a, an expression very similar to DDPG, where my update to the mean parameters is uh, an integral over all possible states of the gradient of the smooth Q value with respect to input action uh, at input action equal to my mean. And this is very easy. Given knowledge of the Q values, I can easily take the gradient and compute this. Now, the covariance parameters are a little different. If I were to apply the same technique, I would get the following expression, that the gradient of the expected reward objective with respect to covariance has to do something with the gradient of the smooth Q value with respect to covariance. And this is a little more difficult because the covariance is not a, exactly an input argument into the smooth Q value. If you remember, the covariance actually plays a role in the definition of the smooth Q value, but it's not an argument into, into the smooth Q value itself. And so this is a little harder, and I, I, we don't really want to deal with this integral in the definition because this, applies, this implies knowledge of the expected Q values, which well, we want to replace completely. And so we thought about this uh, long and hard and eventually found this really amazing identity associated with any Gaussian integral. And the identity is as follows. So for any Gaussian integral defined in the way that smooth Q values are, the gradient of the smooth Q value with respect to covariance is exactly one half times the Hessian of the smooth Q value with respect to input action. And this is really amazing. And, and let me be clear that this uh, identity is exact. There's no approximation. Uh, there's no assumption on what the form of the smooth Q value is. Whatever it is, this identity holds. And so now we're able to derive an update to the covariance parameters that's much more simple. So now our update is simply going to be one half of the integral over all possible states of the Hessian of the smooth Q values with respect to input action. OK, so now we've got deterministic updates to the mean and deterministic updates to the covariance. And now let me show you the second set of uh, very interesting equations that allow smooth Q values to be learned from off policy data. So in reinforcement learning, when, whenever we have a Q value and we want to learn it off policy, we need a Bellman equation. And uh, smooth Q values do have their own Bellman equation. Uh, if you recall, uh, I define the smooth Q values at the, as, the scout, as the Scaussian convolution with the expected Q values, and you can also uh, define them in the converse. You can define the expected Q value in terms of the smooth Q value. And uh, without getting too much in the, into the details, you can see the paper for all the details, you can derive a Bellman equation based on these two equations. So the smooth Q values satisfy this equation that relates the smooth Q value at a specific state action pair to the smooth Q values at the next state. And, uh, so, and I won't get into the details again. It's all in the paper. You can use this uh, Bellman equation to train a parameterized Q, smooth Q value approximator to satisfy this equation using off-policy experience. But what I really want to show you is that uh, after we found this uh, neat Bellman equation, we later found that this equation is actually only a specific case of a much more general set of equations, which I, which I think are much more impressive. So we call these equations the derivative Bellman equations for the smooth Q values. And they relate the derivative of any order of the smooth Q value function to the smooth Q value functions at the next state. And this is quite amazing, because if you were to try to write the same sort of equation of a derivative of a Q value for like the expected Q values or any other sort of Q values, you would have to assume some additional information about the environment. You would have to assume that perhaps you know what the derivative of the reward function of the environment is, which is, is not the case in reinforcement learning. You don't know that. But in our case, with smooth Q values, we can write these derivative Bellman equations 
that don't rely on any additional knowledge of the environment. So that's quite neat. And so now we have all the elements necessary for smoothie. So in smoothie, to recap, we maintain a Gaussian policy and a smooth Q-value approximator. At every iteration, we choose some action A sampled from our Gaussian policy, we observe a reward and a next state, and add that transition to a replay buffer. Periodically, we sample batches of transitions from the replay buffer, and we update our Q-value approximator via the smooth Bellman equations. And then we use that same batch to update both the mean according to the gradients of the smooth Q-value and the covariance according to the Hessians of the smooth Q-value. And so now we've, we've achieved our goal, right? We can train a fully specified Gaussian policy using deterministic updates to the policy parameters. And so we evaluated Smoothie uh, on a number of experiments. Uh, we took the continuous control benchmarks uh, commonly associated uh, with Majoco. We used neural networks for the policy and Q values, uh, and, uh, as well as proximal policy regularization. Uh, and the results are as follows. So we compare it to DDPG because implementation-wise, Smoothie is um, almost exactly the same as DDPG. Uh, and we see that the results overall show that Smoothie is at least as good performing as DDPG. And especially on the harder tasks, like if you look at Humanoid or Hoppo, uh, and to some extent Ant and Waco, we do find a substantial improvement from using Smoothie. So these results really show that uh, not only is, is, are the smooth Q values th these really neat, uh, peculiar uh, mathematical uh, invention, but they also have practical application and, and show really substantial benefits in practice. Uh, and so I'll, I'll leave my concluding points up here, and I'll, I'll use the remaining time for any questions. Okay, we have a few minutes for questions. Please walk to the mic if you have a question. Um, I have a question, which will not surprise you. Can you explain how this is different from expected policy gradients, which also marginalizes across uh, the action in a stochastic policy, analytically? Yeah, so the key difference between uh, our work and expected policy gradients is that we uh, essentially define this uh, integral of expected Q values as its own function, and we approximate it uh, as its own uh, function itself, whereas in expected policy gradient, they, uh, they use the integral in its raw form. So their updates require an approximate integral. So although they do have the deterministic updates, which are very good, they do require approximating the integral, whereas we really use the neural network, uh, learn the smooth Q values themselves. Great, but for many classes of policies, that integral is not approximated. It's computed analytically, and that includes the, the Gaussian policies that you focus on. Uh, I think it only has an analytic solution based on specific forms of the Q value, like if the Q value is quadratic. Uh, and in our case, this identity associated with the covariance is uh, an identity that holds no matter what the form of the true Q value is. We can maybe discuss that more offline. Are there any other questions? And um, do you empirically see the variance terms going to zero? And have you tried mixing it with maximum entropy methods, anything like that? Mm. Uh, so we do empirically show, that, uh, well, we see in, in the experiments I showed you that uh, the, the covariance parameters do uh, converge to zero eventually. Uh, in terms of uh, maximum entropy methods, so the only sort of thing we tried was uh, applying proximal policy regularization, which is a sort of form of maximum entropy, but otherwise, no. We have time for one more question. So how much of your result is tied to Gaussian smoothing? Can you do with other type probably distributions for smoothing? So the basic uh, concept of uh, using, well, the basic concept of not uh, taking an average over expected Q values, but instead defining a new function that uh, should give you the expected value, uh, should in principle be applicable to any sort of policy. Uh, Gaussian policies uh, in particular just give you all sorts of neat identities that other forms of policies might not. Okay, let's thank our speaker again. Okay, the next speaker is Thomas, who will tell us about off-policy maximum entropy deep reinforcement learning. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. So I'm going to introduce soft actor Friedrich, which is an off-policy 
uh, model-free algorithm for learning maximum entry policies. Um, first, I will start with a video. And on this video, you see a half cheetah robot that is being trained with soft actor critic. And there are two interesting things going on here, here in this video. On the bottom, you see the number of uh, episodes consumed so far by the algorithm, and also the return of the, pre of the latest episode. As you see, the number of episodes is very small at the point when, when the agent starts, uh, figures out how to run. In fact, it's already comparable, almost comparable to many model-based approaches. Second, in fact, I, I chose this video by cherry-picking one, one of my tra training runs. And the reason why I did that is that we all know that a reinforcement learning is very, you typically gives very high variance results. So that's why I ran the algorithm 10 times, and then I picked the one that got, uh, gave me the, um, the smallest reward. So I did that because in, in, when we want to, if we want to use these algorithms in the real world, we need to make, make sure that they work every single time, and not only on average. Here is another illustration of the same, same uh, situation. So here I'm comparing our algorithm to DDBG, or Deep Deterministic Policy Gradient, I, I, and I ran 10 different random seeds. And as you um, DDBG is known, known to be very sample efficient, but also have very high variance results. And as you see in this um, plot, every time when we run DDBG, we don't really know what we, what, what we get. And there is indeed a lot of variation. On the other hand, soft actor critic have uh, much more consistent, consistent results, and also it learns faster. Soft actor critic is based on uh, maximization of the maximum entropy objective. This objective is otherwise similar to standard reinforcement learning objective, but it also includes the entropy of the policy for the future, future states. The entropy is multiplied with the temperature coefficient alpha, and if we let the alpha to go to zero, we can recover the standard reinforcement learning objective. But for, non, for any non-zero alpha, the optimal policy has this energy-based form where the, where the Q function can be viewed as the negative, negative energy. Existing solutions for learning these maximum entry policies mainly um, falls into this um, soft Q learning ca category. Um, which here I'm quite loosely speaking about these algorithms, but, but the common to all of them is that they learn the optimal Q function Q star directly. The problem with this approach, especially in continuous domains, is that the optimal, optimal policy has this energy-based form, so the optimal policy is intractable in continuous domains. And that means that our algorithm is learning a Q function that is not consistent with our current policy, especially if we are using Gaussian policies or other parameterized forms of policies. The other problem is that soft Q learning, it, it typically, there are many ways to implement it, uh, but they typically um, rely on biased stochastic gradients, and that problem is also related to the interactability of the policy. On the other hand, we, we propose soft actor critic. Uh, it's different from soft key learning in that it learns the Q function of the current policy and the policy jointly. It is very similar to DDPG, but it learns stochastic policies, and it's very easy to implement. It's sample efficient, and it gives consistent results. In fact, we introduced two new algorithms. The first one is provably convergent soft policy iteration algorithm, which unfortunately works only in, in tabular domains. A practical approximation of soft policy iteration is what we call soft actor critic, and that works for uh, on continuous actions as well. So I'll start with the soft policy iteration. Soft policy iteration uh, alternates between two steps. The first step is soft policy evaluation. In that step, our policy is fixed, and we apply a soft Bellman backup operator to an arbitrary Q function until the Q function converges. The soft Bellman backup is otherwise similar to the standard Bellman backup op operator, but it also accounts for the entropy, or the expected negative log pi term shown in red. We can show that this, this um, procedure converges to the Q, Q function or the soft Q fu function of the, of the fixed policy pi. In the next step, we improve the policy. So that's called the soft policy improvement step. And we update the policy according to, uh, by minimizing the, the KL divergence between the policy and the exponentiated Q values. It's not uh, immediately clear if this, why this update makes sense, but we can show that the Q value for the new policy is greater than equal than the um, Q value of the previous policy. Then we repeat from step one. 
and we repeat this until this converges, and we can show that this leads to a, a sequence of policies with monotonically increasing Q values. And at the, op uh, at the convergence, we, we, uh, we find the policy that is optimal among the policy class that we are interested in um, uh, solving, for example, Gaussian policies. Um, so then, soft actor critic is a practical um, approximation of soft policy iteration. It uses function approximators, it optimizes the two step jointly using stochastic gradients, and it runs also a separate value function. That's not strictly required, but we can show that it sometimes I improves uh, stability. And we also use two Q functions and take the minimum of the two to update the policy and the value function. This is actually a new trick, which is very similar to um, double Q learning, but was um, very recently introduced by Fujimoto et al. for DDPG style algorithms. And I believe he's going to talk right after me. So it also turns out to help for soft actor critic, critic a lot. Um, we can also finally show that uh, all the stochastic gradients that we use for updating the policy Q function and the value function are, are unbiased and we can evaluate them using off policy data. So how well soft actor critic works? Here we are comparing SAC to DDPG, PPO, and also soft key learning on a humanoid task. And as you see, our, our method outperforms all the prior methods with a large margin. We also compared, to, compared our method to the prior works in uh, other easier tasks, and in all cases, our method is substantially better than the other, others, uh, except on the easier tasks, PPO, is, is typically as good as SAC. One thing I want to emphasize here is that the shaded region, it typically corresponds to the standard deviation among the training uh, trials. But in this case, I chose it, uh, I'm showing the minimum and maximum performance among five, among five seeds. So as you see, there, is a, a, there isn't much variation between uh, these five seeds on soft actor critic. And in fact, it, it is even more consistent than PPO, which is considered to be one of the most stable, uh, stable algorithms. We can also use soft actor critic to train on the real robot. So in this case, our action space is the torques on all seven actuators, and our state space consists of the uh, joint angles and velocities. We can, we can train this robot to stack Lego blocks, and it takes about two hours to do that. Um, we have released our code, so check that out. And with this, I would like to thank my collaborators and thank you for listening. We have a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, so I have a question. Um, I was a bit confused when you said the gradient is unbiased but then you're taking the minimum of two Q functions. Does that, first of all, wouldn't you be doing that in order to reduce bias and taking that minimum, doesn't that lead to a biased estimate? Actually, that's a really good point. So um, yeah, without taking the minimum of the two, two Q functions, then it's unbiased. But when we use the trick and use two Q functions, then we don't have that guarantee anymore. So. Any other questions? So just quickly, uh, I don't think you showed us the, the actual algorithm that you used, but I guess you're just adding in the entropy term to the reward. Is that correct, or did I miss it? Um, so the algorithm is basically um, an approximation of soft policy iteration. So yes, the difference is that we are adding for the Q function updates, we are adding the entropy. And also for the policy updates, uh, we are minimizing the KL divergence between the policy and the exponentiated Q. So, um, and, and then in practice, we do both of these steps at the same time using stochastic gradients. And that's, that's the algorithm. It's very similar to DDPG, except uh, it has the entropy terms in both policy update and the Q function update. So is it just you add that to the reward? Um, Yes, you can think about it. we just add it to the reward. That's okay. Th that's right. Thank you. Okay, let's thank our speaker again.
Okay, the final speaker is Scott Fujimoto, who will tell us about addressing function approximation error in actor critic methods. All right, thanks. Uh, so before I begin, I'd like to thank my collaborators, uh, Herke Van Hoof and David Meager. Um, this work is presenting a novel deep reinforcement learning algorithm, which works in consideration of overestimation bias and outperforms the state of the art in the open IGM benchmarks. Um, so what is overestimation bias? I'm going to start with the story. Uh, so when I was young, I used to play a lot of video games, and I practiced a lot against my older brother. And the one thing I thought at the time is, man, if I can beat my older brother, I'll be able to beat all of my friends. Um, sadly, once I finally did beat my older brother, I found out this was not really true, and it was because my brother played differently than my friends. And my ability to beat my brother was really only an approximation uh, of my ability to beat my friends. And ultimately, I was overfitting my estimation of how good I was at video games uh, to my ability to beat my brother. In reinforcement learning, we call this overconfidence, overestimation bias. It, it comes from Goodhart's law, which states that a measure, um, once a measure becomes a target, it ceases to become a good measure. In deep reinforcement learning, the measure we use is our approximate value function. Specifically, in value-based reinforcement learning, our agents are optimized with respect to a learn Q function, taking a max operator over a set of discrete possible actions. But however, since our approximate value function is, does not correspond exactly with the true value function, we will over-optimize uh, to this approximate value function and, and overestimate the, the, the true value. Um, so this can result sort of in this propagation of, of, of overestimated values and then suboptimal action selections. And this is sort of behavior has been really well studied in a discrete action setting, but uh, in this we're going to extend it to uh, an actor critic setting with continuous actions. So in this work specifically, we're looking at the method DDPG, uh, where the max operator has been replaced with a policy, which is optimized with respect to the Q function. And even without uh, an explicit maximization, uh, this overestimation can still occur due to the uh, local maximization by gradient ascent. And so we have some theoretical evidence in our paper, but the, uh, we can see this most clearly empirically. So in this graph, I have the uh, estimated value of DDPG here in orange against the true value in black. And this is just sort of the, the learning curve over time. And throughout this uh, learning, we have a, a clear overestimation that persists. And so this raises the question, what can we do about this? Well, we'll start by looking at sort of the standard techniques that worked well in a discrete setting. So one of the most well-known techniques is called double Q learning. And this works by having two independent value functions and estimating the value of the policy would derive from uh, each value function through cross-validation. And this was designed for a tabular setting. So in a deep setting, we're going to be using double DQN, where one of the value functions is replaced by the target network. Now, these were both designed for discrete actions. So we combined them with DDPG uh, in an actor critic format to see how well they would work uh, in a, for continuous actions. So here's double DQN, um, and we can see some improvement. But again, there's still a very clear overestimation. And we also tried double uh, Q learning. And again, slightly better, but not quite enough. So what exactly is going on here? Well, in an actor critic setting, we sort of lost the independent estimation that's required for cross validation. So in double DQN, we note that um, uh, in this sort of actor critic setting, we have an actor that changes slowly. And this means our value estimate is going to change slowly, and in turn, the target network. And again, we sort of make this design choice in an actor critic format to update the target network more often. So this is a, a design choice, but the outcome of this is that um, the networks will be too similar for this sort of independent estimation. And in double Q learning, uh, we use the opposite critic in the update. They use the same repo replay buffer, so they're somewhat tied together. So to counteract this effect, we propose clip double Q learning. And the idea here is we're just going to take the minimum between the two critics in double Q learning. This corresponds to taking either the standard update or the double update. And the idea is if pi 1 is optimized with respect to q1, q1 will overestimate the, the, the value of pi 1, and we never want q2 to be higher than q1. So we'll clip the value of q2 by q1, which corresponds to taking the minimum. Really, the idea here is that if we have two biased estimates, we should be pessimistic about the true value. So it turns out this works really well. So our method here is in blue, and we can see that the true value lies nearly exactly on top with the estimated value. However, this doesn't mean our value is actually perfect. It just means that we've decorrelated the errors from the maximization bias. 
So it's important to note that even with decorrelated or uncorrelated errors, um, we can still have suboptimal action selection. So now we'll look at sort of the root cause of overestimation bias, which comes from sort of this noise from function approximation error. These errors are particularly problematic because they build up through temporal difference learning, where errors are propagated backwards. Um, uh, are propagated backwards. So if there's any error in the target, it will build up. And this is when overestimation can become a big problem. Fortunately, it turns out we already have a great tool to do, deal with this, and it's target networks. So target networks are this sort of standard technique where we have a frozen version of the current network, which is updated to the current network after a discrete number of time steps or by some proportion. And the idea here is if deep networks need multiple uh, time steps to converge, we provide a stable objective. So we really wanted to sort of investigate how, what the role of target networks were in this actor critic setting. So we uh, compared different sets of GDPG with different target update rates. And what we found is when we kept the policy fixed throughout our experiment and just learned the critic, um, they all the update rates sort of uh, converged to the true value, no problem. However, when we learned the policy at the same time, if the target network was updated very quickly, the sort of buildup of error occurred and we had these huge overestimations. So our next proposal here is that uh, we should perhaps delay the policy updates. So it's standard in actor critic to update the actor once every time we update the critic, but what if we just update the, uh, the actor less often? And what we found is when we did this, we actually had improved performance and, and stability, even though we were training the actor less. And the reason this works is because we're allowing the value function to converge before making an update. So the updates that do occur will be of higher quality. Finally, we found that deterministic policies are highly susceptible to small errors, uh, any sort of errors in the value function. So we'll regularize the target sort of using the SARSA style update by uh, smoothing around the target action by just adding about a, a bit of noise and then clipping it to remove outliers. So we combined uh, these three techniques with DDPG to form twin delayed uh, DDPG, also known as TD3. Uh, taking the minimum between two critics and adding noise to the target policy and only updating the actor after D time steps. And it turns out we can get really awesome results doing this. So this is on the OpenAI gym uh, bench, uh, benchmarks and uh, for one million time steps against CDPG here uh, in orange and our method in blue. And we also compared against PPO uh, here in red. So to summarize uh, some takeaways from my presentation is that uh, you will over-optimize uh, over the metric that you optimize with respect to. And this means that overestimation will occur in actor critic methods and correcting it will improve performance. Uh, target networks are sort of really important because they reduce this uh, buildup of error, which is critical with the recursive maximization operation that occurs in Q-learning. And updating the policy less can actually improve performance and sort of gives this free speed up in our actor critic algorithms. And finally, I'll end with a, a sales pitch. Um, use our algorithm. The code is online. It's really short, uh, only un under 200 lines. There's comments, uh, and I think if you're interested in getting into the sort of the state of the art uh, DeepRL for continuous control, this is a really easy way to do it. So uh, check it out. Thanks so much for listening. We have a couple minutes for questions. Please walk to the mic. Uh, I have a question. So this idea of updating the actor less often than the critic, um, so this is definitely part of the sort of folk wisdom of um, how you get actor-critic methods to work in practice. And I, I never thought about it carefully, but I always assumed the, the intuition here is that it's like generalized policy iteration. You do some amount of policy evaluation before you do any policy improvement. Is that intuition consistent with your results, or are you giving us now a new story? Uh, no, I would say that's pretty much uh, consistent. Of course, um, you don't want to delay too much because then you're just never updating the actor. Uh, but that's relatively, yeah, that's basically the story, right? We want to get an accurate uh, value estimate and then perform an update, get an accurate value estimate, perform an update. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank our speaker again. That's the end of the session. Thank you all for coming.